We're in the thirteenth segment. This is entitled "Walking by the Spirit," um, and we're still in July of twenty twenty four for another day. Yeah. Uh, see, the one who has not yet understood the lessons of Chapter Six regarding his identification with Christ continues in the struggle. Although he has already been delivered from the power of sin, it has not yet become an experiential reality in his life. As the born-again one recognizes the wickedness of sin and attempts to bring it under control in his life, he experiences defeat, frustration, and failure. Many believers continue trying to bring the flesh into subjection by their works, by developing better habits, imposing rules, regulations, resolutions, can't eat meat for Lent, things like that. Recognizing the wickedness of the old man nature and failing to realize that it has already been crucified with Christ, they try to crucify it themselves. The Apostle Paul used himself as the example of the believer struggling against sin. He wanted to do good, but the sin nature within him caused him to do what he didn't want to do. So we'll pick it up in Romans 7, 16 to 23. So if I do what I do not want to do, then I consent to the law that it is good. Now, however, it is no more I who produce it, but rather the sin dwelling in me. For I know that good is not dwelling in me, that is, in my flesh, the old nature. The desire is present with me, but not how to produce good. Thus, I do not do the good that I want to do, but I do practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now, if I do this that I do not want to do, then it no more it is no more me producing it, but instead the sin dwelling in me, in the old flesh nature. So then, because evil is present with me, I search and find the law for when I desire to do good. Therefore, I delight in the law of God according to the inner person. However, I see a different kind of law in my bodily members, warring against the law in my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of the sin that is in my bodily members. This section concerns a man who is trying to live according to the law. In verse 16, he said that he consented to the law, that it is good. Verse 22, he said that he delights in the law of God. He wants to do what is right and yet finds himself doing the opposite. His reason tells him what he should do, but the law of sin in his members brings him into captivity so that he does the very things he hates and doesn't do the things he desires to do. Verse 24 says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Is this the utterance of one reigning in life by Jesus Christ? having considered himself dead indeed in the sin and alive unto God in Christ Jesus? Instead of a shout of victory, it's a cry of despair. Here we have one who desperately desires to live the Christian life and yet finds the sin nature defeating him. The word wretched refers to one who is afflicted with such great toil, hardship, and misery. Woe is me. The expression body of this death could be rendered this dead body. In the lands and times of the Bible, a condemned criminal was sometimes tied to a dead body. Bishop Casey Pillai said this was an allusion to the cry of someone who was uh, executed in the lands and times of the Bible by tying that person to a dead body. The cry of the person who has the new nature is with regard to the old nature to which he is currently bound, which is a body of death. The man who is trying by his own efforts to get free from the sin nature experiences its horror in the same way as a man strapped to a corpse. Earlier, the old nature was called the body of sin. Uh, Williams handles verse 24 as, Wretched man that I am, who can save me from this deadly lower nature? I thought that was pretty well put. Seeking deliverance from the sin nature and failing to find it in total despair, the believer cries out, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this dead body of the sin nature? Verse 25 is the answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for the deliverance. So then with the mind, I myself do indeed serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. 
This refers to the law of God after the inward man that was mentioned in verse 22. This law is contrasted with the law of sin that was mentioned in verse 23. The deliverance is not something future, but something already done. Paul came to the realization that what he could not accomplish through his own efforts by legal observance, as his struggles against sin had already been accomplished by the finished work of Jesus Christ and the believer's complete identification with him. We can continue to live according to the law, attempting by our own efforts to subdue the flesh while crying out how miserable we are. Or we can realize that something greater has come. The deliverance that came by Jesus Christ has given us a new way of walking. I can now cry, oh, blessed man that I am. We can now walk by the new nature rather than by the old. Romans 6, 1 to 7, 25 dealt with certain aspects of the walk in newness of life for those who have been justified. Having in Romans 5 described the justice of God, and the means by which those who have believed regarding Jesus Christ are justified from the sin of Adam and reconciled to God with a new eternal life. Romans 6 began a discussion of the walk and that newness of life with its fruit in contrast with the old walk in the flesh, the old nature with its fruit. Having died to the sin and having been made free from the sin, those who have the justification are to now render their bodily members as servants to that justice and have fruit unto sanctification. The conflict between the old nature and the new nature is described as it relates both to the accomplished realities and to the walk. Part of that walk for those who have the new spirit nature is to consider themselves dead to the sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, as what was expressed in Romans 6.11. Now, the discussion in Romans 6 and 7 gives a basis for some of the things that will be discussed in chapter 8. And at the same time, Romans 8 is a continuation of things dealt with earlier in the epistle, especially the discussion regarding the justification from Adam's condemnation and death in Romans 5. Romans 8, 1. So there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation, Greek, katakrima, meaning condemnation or the sentence pronounced against someone. This refers back to the condemnation mentioned in Romans 5, 16, and 18, which was death, the loss of spirit life, which was Adam's condemnation, and which had passed upon all men. Romans 8 speaks of those who had been justified and who are no longer under that condemnation. The, works, the words in Christ Jesus refers to our identification in him. We have a new life in Christ. We are alive unto God, having God's gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. The truth of no condemnation to the believer is not founded upon his walk. Our works or good character did not give us our position in Christ Jesus. When we believed regarding Jesus Christ and accepted his finished work on our behalf, we became completely united with him in his death and resurrection. And at that point, we were delivered from condemnation. Romans 5, 16 to 18. Likewise, the gift is not as the trespass by it, the one who sinned. For the judgment was of one, Adam, unto condemnation. But the free gift of grace is from many trespasses unto a standard for justice. So if by the trespass of the one, the death reigned through the one, Adam, much more than they who received the abundance of the grace and of the gift of the justice will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then as through one trespass, judgment was passed to all men unto condemnation, even so through one standard for justice, judgment was passed to all men unto justification of life. The judgment was by one man, Adam, through a single act of disobedience, the condem condem condemnation, condemnation, man, if I condemnation for all men but the free gift comes to all who believe on the on the one man jesus christ his one great act of obedience unto death brings justification from sin and right standing with god despite the many acts of disobedience we have committed the condemnation didn't come because of what we had done but because of what adam did 
Likewise, deliverance from condemnation was not due to our works, but to our believing on the one who accomplished our salvation. We read about that in John 3, 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The world was already condemned in Adam. All men remained in, con in condemnation unless they believed on the one who came to bring salvation and everlasting life. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The one who believes on him who sent Jesus Christ shall not come into condemnation. The condemnation came the very day when Adam disobeyed God's commandment and became spiritually dead. The condemnation is death, which is separation from God, and the opposite is life, which is reconciliation with God. Now listen to this. Eternal life is not a destination. We are headed, it's not a destination we are headed toward, but an unending relationship with God we already enjoy. Eternal life is not a destination we're heading, headed toward, but it's an unending relationship with God that we already enjoy. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The word know here refers to knowing by personal experience and thus to be intimately acquainted with. Those who are still in the condemnation, not having passed unto life, cannot know God. Could there be anything more tragic in an individual's life? Could the one who cries out, a wretched man that I am, have the thought that he isn't really born again? Could he think that he was still in the condemnation? If he fails to find the newness of life that he thought the gospel offered, he could easily be led to believe that he just must not be saved. Why are all these things happening? Chapter 7 revealed that as the believer endeavors to produce fruit unto holiness, there is a tremendous conflict between the old nature of Adam and the new nature of Christ. He tries to subdue the flesh through rules and regulation and resolution, but finds himself powerless, frustrated and defeated. He wants to do what is right and avoid doing what is wrong. But inexplicitly, he discovers that he does the opposite. The promise of new life in Christ isn't personally realized for him. So he cries out, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The, the body of sin, uh, which was crucified with Christ in 6-6, seems like a corpse strapped to him from which he can't free himself. It's that intense. All his efforts to become a spiritual man have been met with failure. Instead of a life of blessing, his life's miserable. Rather than overcoming the old man nature, he seems more tightly bound in its grip. He has come to an astonishing realization. Just as his works couldn't earn him justice and eternal life, all his efforts at keeping the law, the Mosaic law or any other form of law, do not bring him personal victory in his walk with God. Along with the cry of despair, however, there is the joyful realization of victory. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It finally dawns on the believer that he can reign in life only through Jesus Christ. He must abandon all his efforts to reign in life by his own commitment, discipline, abilities, and resources. He realizes that within his flesh, the old nature, there dwells no good thing. And that without Christ, he can do nothing. He understands that he's already been delivered from the dead body of the sin nature by the finished work of Jesus Christ. The New English Bible translation of Romans 8.1. The conclusion of the matter is this. There is no condemnation for those who are united in Christ Jesus. This verse has nothing to do with self-condemnation in one's own mind and heart, but with that condemnation that came through Adam, the condemnation of death. Chapter 8 instructs the believer on how he can live victoriously by walking by the Spirit. 
Walking by the Spirit begins with the full assurance that in Christ Jesus there is no condemnation. Even if a believer feels totally defeated in the struggle to subdue the old nature, his problem is that he has taken the wrong approach. He has no clear vision of who he really is in Christ, but instead he's allowed the world and past experiences to dictate who he is. He has based his identification on something other than the revelation of God's word. Instead of considering himself crucified with Christ and dead to sin, he has tried by his own efforts to crucify the old man. Rather than accepting the truth that he is dead to the law, he has attempted to regulate his behavior by the law, either self-imposed law or law prescribed by others. Yet, as long as a man tries to live under law rather than by grace, sin continues to have dominion over him in his daily life. Verse 2. Because the law of the Spirit, that is to say, the life in Christ Jesus, has made me free from the law of the sin and of the death. The word spirit pneuma throughout this section is used to refer to the totality of the new spirit nature received from God. The law of the spirit of the life in Christ Jesus refers to the same law that was referred to in Romans 7.22 as the law of God after the inward man in Romans 7.25 that just simply has the law of God. And according to Romans 8.2, that law made us free from the law of sin and death, which was contrasted with the law of God in Romans 7, 23 and 25. The law of the sin and the death was the former law given to Moses for the children of Israel that dealt with sin in the old nature and by which sin became exceedingly sinful. Hey, now that I got a law, I realize how sinful I am. The spirit you have received is more than a mass of new abilities, okay? The spirit you have received, it's more than a mass of new abilities. It's a new you. The law of the spirit, the new nature we have received from God, which is life because of our identification in Christ Jesus, is contrasted with the law of sin and death. Now, the word law refers to a rule or principle governing one's actions. Chapter 7 unveiled the power of the law of sin and death. Paul found himself enslaved to sin, doing the opposite of what he wanted to do. Likewise, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is a ruling principle governing one's actions. Both laws are inner workings. Just as the law of sin works within a man, so does the law of the spirit. Philippians 2.13, Bob. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And Weiss translates this, for God is the one who is constantly putting forth his energy in you, both in the form of your being desirous and of your doing his good pleasure. It is an inworking of God, but the desires and actions are left to the free will choices of the individual. He must will and he must do. We makes this observation. This new nature gives the Christian both a desire and power to do God's will, and the desire and the power to refuse to obey the evil nature. Until a believer learns to walk by the new nature, he may want to do what is right, but he does not have the power to perform it. Freedom in our daily lives comes when we focus our attention and energies on the law of the Spirit, the new nature, which is life in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 3. In fact, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning sin, condemned the sin in the flesh. The Old Testament law could never make a man free from the law of sin and death because of the weakness of the flesh, the old sin nature. Thus, the law could never bring us victory in our walks. Jesus Christ came in the flesh, and it was like the flesh everyone else had. However, it was not sinful flesh, for there was no sin in him. By offering himself as a sacrifice for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Thayer defines the words condemn the sin to mean deprived sin of its power. I thought that was pretty good. Deprived sin of its power. This would agree with the truth of Romans 6, 6, that the body of the sin might be destroyed, rendered powerless, made inactive. While it was impossible for the law to subdue the old nature, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ broke sin's power 
in the flesh. Verse 4. So that the standard for justice of the law of Moses might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The standard of justice set forth in the law of Moses is fulfilled in those who walk according to the new spirit nature, and not by those who attempt to walk according to the old flesh nature, which has been dealt with in previous times by the law of Moses. Now, the word flesh is used throughout this passage. In fact, it's in Romans 8, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 12, and 13. This is kind of important. And it's in contrast to the new spirit nature to refer to the old nature of mankind, which was corrupt according to deceitful desires, and which was dead in trespasses and sins. For the people of Israel, in the times before Jesus Christ's accomplishments, it was dealt with by the law of Moses, or in the law of Moses. What does Williams say? About, uh, how does he translate verse 4? So that the requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live by the standard set by the lower nature, but the standard set by the Spirit. What is that standard for justice of the law? If one could take the entire Old Testament law and sum it up, what would he say? Why, Jesus answered that question. Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, this is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus declared that the intent of the entire law was love. Love for God and love for one's neighbor. Paul also taught that love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13, 8 to 10, working translation. Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another for he who loves another has fulfilled the law for example from exodus 20 13 to 17 you will not commit adultery you will not murder you will not steal you will not covet and if there is any other commandment it is summed up under one heading in this word namely from leviticus 19 18 you will love your neighbor as yourself Love does not work evil to the neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love was the intent of the law. But because of the weakness of the old nature, the law could never produce love. A man could carry out the letter of the law with no love. For instance, man could keep the commandment, thou shalt not steal, because of the fear of the consequences of being caught rather than the love for his neighbor. But now the Spirit from God gives us the desire the ability and the strength to love. Romans 5.5. 5. And the hope does not disgrace by disappointed expectations because God's love has been poured out in our hearts by means of Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. The one who has received the Spirit and manifests this love of God will not steal from his neighbor for his desires to give and bless. Anyone walking by the Spirit will not do anything hurtful to others. The standard of justice of the law will be met without the believer ever thinking about doing the law. Romans 8, 5. In fact, those who are according to the flesh think the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit can think the things of the Spirit. To be according to the flesh or according to the Spirit refers back to the standard of one's walk of verse 4. The word think means to direct one's attention to a thing to seek or strive for, or to set one's heart's desire upon. Those whose standard is to walk by the old nature will direct their attention to, strive for, and set their heart's desires on the things of the old nature, while those whose standard is to walk by the new nature will direct their attention to, strive for, and set their heart's desire on the things of the new nature. Colossians 3.2 Think the things that are above, not the things that are upon the earth. Those who walk according to the new nature think they direct their minds and set their heart's desire on things that are above and not on the things that are upon the earth. Uh, Romans 8, 5 again. In fact, those who are according to the flesh think the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit can think the things of the Spirit.
you know, common teaching is that the exp of the uh, is that the expression "those who are according to the flesh" refers to unsaved men. However, in the context, we are dealing with the walk of a believer. Those who are born again could choose to continue walking according to the flesh. The believers in Corinth, who though being sanctified in Christ Jesus, are described as fleshly, cardinal, having envying, strife, and divisions, just like the people in the world. They had the spirit of God, but they walked by the old nature. Those in Galatia tried to perfect themselves by the flesh, putting themselves under the law. They too walked after the flesh. They walked after the old nature. Verse 6. So the thinking of the flesh is death, but the thinking of the spirit is life and peace. Those who are thinking of the flesh direct their thoughts to the old nature, while those who are thinking of the spirit direct their thoughts to the new nature. The thinking of the old nature is death. In this context, it refers neither to spiritual death nor to physical death, but to all the miseries arising from sin, leading to a separation from God and one's lifestyle. While the thinking of the old nature brings death, the thinking of the new nature is life and peace. Verse 7. Because the thinking of the flesh is hostility against God, for it is not in subjection to the law of God, nor can it be. The old nature and the new nature are opposed to each other. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Now I say, walk by means of the Spirit, and you will in no way carry out the craving of the flesh. In fact, the flesh craves against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these things are opposed to each other, with the result that you do not do what you desire to do. The spirit, the new nature, and the flesh, the old nature, are absolutely contrary to each other. When a believer walks by the new nature, it is impossible for him to fulfill the lust of the old nature. Likewise, when he walks by the old nature, he cannot do the things of the new nature. The key to overcoming defeating habits of the old nature in our lives is to focus on those things we want, the things of God. Victory in our lives comes when we make the new nature the great standard of our lives. Then our thoughts will be directed toward that and away from the things of the old nature. Verses 22 and 23. However, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, believing, meekness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. When a man walks by the new nature, this fruit will be produced in his life. Just as an apple tree by nature will produce apples, the new spiritual nature will produce fruit. One does not have to beat the apple tree to produce apples. Neither does one get better results by trying to make himself bear spiritual fruit. Fruit will absolutely follow the one walking by the new nature. Furthermore, no law is necessary to regulate the behavior. You know? Do we need a commandment? Thou shalt be less loving. Or maybe control your joy. See, law has nothing to do with the believer who walks by the Spirit. Romans 8, 8 and 9. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. You are not in the flesh but in the Spirit. Since the Spirit from God dwells in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit, that is to say Christ, then he does not belong to him. It is impossible for an unbeliever one who is in the flesh, the old nature, to please God, for he will always be fleshly or carnally minded. But the believers are not in the flesh, since the Spirit of God dwells in them. The man who does not have the Spirit of Christ now does not belong to Christ. While an unbeliever can never please God, the one who belongs to Christ can choose to please God by minding the things of the new nature. Verse 10. But since Christ dwells in you, then the body the old nature, is indeed dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of justice. The body is not literally dead, and therefore this occurrence of the word body is a figure of speech of autonomy used to refer to the old nature, the flesh that has been discussed previously is that which is dead without spirit life because of Adam's sin. Romans 6.6 6 also spoke of the body of the sin being made inactive as the result of the old man being crucified with Christ. Romans 6.11 said to consider yourself, first of all, dead to the sin. And secondly, being alive to God in Christ Jesus. Justness 
in Greek, dikino sune, means justice, justness, or righteousness. According to an established standard, the justice or righteousness of God is according to God's standard, and by that standard, Jesus Christ did what was necessary for mankind to be made just, that is, to have justness. You can check Romans 4, 22 to 25 if you'd like. Verse 11. If the spirit from him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of or by his spirit dwelling in you. Since the new nature of the one who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in us, God will also make our mortal bodies alive by means of that indwelling new nature. This section of Romans doesn't deal with the future, but with that which is available to the believer now. Since that spirit dwells in us, it is certainly the case that it gives life to, the, to these mortal bodies. Phillips translates verse 11. Once the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives within you, he will by the same spirit bring to our whole being, yes, even your mortal bodies, new strength and vitality. For he now lives in you. It's God and Christ in you. Within these bodies, even now, having the seeds of physical death because of Adam's sin, we have the resurrection of life of, of Christ. The new birth is so great that it even makes a difference in our physical bodies today. Verse 12. So then, brothers, we are not under obligation to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Moffat translates verse 12 as, Well then, my brothers, we owe a duty, but it is not to the flesh. It is not to live by the flesh. We could choose to live according to the old nature, but we shouldn't do so. Verse 13. In fact, if you live according to the flesh, then you will die. But if by means of the spirit you put to death the practices of the body, the old nature, then you will live. Moffat translates this as, if you live by the flesh, you are on the road to death. But if by the Spirit you put the actions of the body to death, you will live. See, the word body is used here by another figure of speech. No, it's still the same one, metonymy. To refer to the old nature, the flesh, as it was in verse 10. The deeds or practices of the old nature are, are to be put to death by means of the totality of the new spiritual nature received from God, including all of its rights, privileges, and abilities that are associated with the new nature. In doing this, one is to live rather than to die. This verse summarizes the solution for the dilemma discussed in Romans 7. Now, verse 14 of Romans 8 there starts a section in Romans that deals with the relationship we have with God as his sons and children. Verse 14. Accordingly, whoever are led by the Spirit that is from God, these are the sons of God. Spirit again refers to the new nature we have received. Those who are not sons of God cannot be led by the Spirit of God. This is the first time in the church epistles that the word translated son is used of the born again ones. In its previous five occurrences in Romans 1, 3, 4, 9, oh, Romans 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 9, 5, 10, and 8, 3, it was always used of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Now it is used of others. Having the Spirit of God is what makes one a son of God. Verse 15. So you have not received a spirit of bondage to again cause fear, but you have received a spirit of sonship, making you sons, whereby we shout, Abba, that is, Father. Spirit is used here to refer to the life of man, its issues and characteristics. Received is lumbano, meaning to take something in order to use it. Thus, it refers here really to manifesting the Spirit. You got the Spirit, so use it, manifest it, lumbano it. Fear is used here in the sense of eek, being afraid, bondage. Now, you've heard of do, do, you know, doulos, here's the female thing. Bondage, douleia, could also be translated as servitude or slavery. We have not received the spirit of slavery to again cause fear, causing us to stay afraid. The second time spirits used, uh, it refers to the totality of the new spirit nature that was received from God. The Greek word for adoption, uh, means sonship, a placing as a son. 
referring here to being sons of God by the new spirit nature received from God. A son can be placed into a family by adoption or birth. In light of numerous other scriptures, it is clear that we are sons of God by birth and not by adoption. An adopted child does not have the adoptive father's seed within, while a child by birth does. Since we are born again of incorruptible seed from God, we must be sons by birth rather than adopted sons. Instead of a slavery, instead of a spirit of slavery, we have received a sonship spirit by which we shout, Abba, Father. The Aramaic word Abba in Romans 8.15 was first used of God by Jesus Christ. In Mark 14.36, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Jesus Christ was the only one in the Bible who had used this term of, term of address to God. It expresses the most intimate fellowship available between a father and son. It would be the speech of a very young child who cries, Daddy, maybe really small, ta-da. The idea is that of total dependence and trust. When Jesus Christ used this term of his heavenly father, he was in a situation of absolute helplessness. He did not want to suffer and die, but he committed himself to God as his Abba. The Judeans would have never have used such a term for God. However, Jesus Christ used it. And so can we who have the spirit of God. We should have both a great reverential awe for God and intimate fellowship with him. When by the spirit of God we cry, Abba, Father, we recognize our complete dependence on God as our father. Walking by the old nature and self-reliant independence brings a life of failure and misery. But walking by the new nature with God as our strength and our sufficiency brings a life of success and blessing. When we are led by the old nature, our cry of despair is, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of this death or from this dead body? But when we walk by the new nature, we cry, Abba, Father. We place our trust in him rather than ourselves. Romans 8, 16. The spirit itself bears witness with our own spirit that we are children of God. The spirit born within us bears witness with our inner being that we are the children of God. First John 5 pretty much lays it out for us. Verse 1 to 9 to 12. Anyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And anyone who loves him, God, who gave birth should also love him, a brother, who has been born of him. Verse 9, if we receive the witness of people, then we ought to recognize that the witness of God is greater. Moreover, the witness of God is this. He has borne witness concerning his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him appear to be a liar, because he has not believed in the witness which God has borne concerning his Son. Now the witness to us is this. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. The one who believes on the Son of God has the witness within himself that he has the Son, and therefore eternal life. The Spirit is his witness that he is born of God. When the new birth spirit was first received on the day of Pentecost, those who were filled with the spirit spoke in tongues, Acts 2, 4. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the spirit was giving them the words to speak out. Years later, Gentiles also received, received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter recounted what had happened when he and six other Judean believers had come to the house of Cornelius in Acts eleven fifteen. 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, even as it did on us in the beginning, on Pentecost. How had the Holy Spirit fallen on the Judeans at the beginning? With the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now the Gentiles had received an evidence really in the same way. Acts 10, 44 to 46. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. 
Then the believers from the circumcision who had come with Peter were amazed because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift from the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speaking in tongues and magnifying God. Peter had to bear witness in Jerusalem to those who had despised the Gentiles and were outraged that he had eaten with them. Their outward reaction changed once Peter explained to them what had transpired. Acts 11, 16 to 18. Then I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you will be baptized with Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the equal gift as he gave to us also who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then who was I to be able to forbid God? When they heard these things, they were quiet and glorified God, saying, Well, surely to the Gentiles also God has God given the foundation for repentance unto life. The, these Judeans had to acknowledge the truth of Peter's testimony, which was confirmed by the six Judean believers who had accompanied him. Since the Gentiles had evidenced the Holy Spirit by speaking in tongues, they admitted that, well, surely God has given them repentance unto life. They didn't ask our permission. In the first century, the believers understood speaking in tongues to be the outward witness of the reality of the presence of the Holy Spirit. When we speak in tongues, we should have an awareness of what it is we have on the inside and who we are. Speaking in tongues should remind us of the reality that we are sons of God. Now, 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Because of this, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, we are children of God now. And although it has not re been revealed what we shall be, we know that when he, Jesus Christ, is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Phillips translates 1 John 3, 1 as, Consider the incredible love that the Father has shown us in allowing us to be called children of God. And this is not just what we are called, but what we are. Romans 8, 15 and 16. So you have not received a spirit of bondage to again cause fear, but you have received a spirit of sonship, making you sons, whereby we shout, Abba, that is, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our own spirit that we are children of God. The New English Bible translates Romans 8, 15 and 16 as, The spirit you have received is not a spirit of slavery leading you back into a life of fear, but a spirit that makes us sons, enabling us to cry, Abba, Father. In that cry, the Spirit of God joins with our spirit in testifying that we are God's children. When a believer speaks in tongues, he has to rely totally upon God to give him the words to speak. He can't trust his own understanding, but must act completely by believing. This initial manifestation of Holy Spirit thus demonstrates to him that he can depend upon God, his Abba, as he walks by the Spirit. Verse 17. And since we are children, then we are heirs also. First of all, heirs of God. And secondly, join heirs with Christ, so that if we do suffer together, we shall also be glorified together as heirs. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and thus we're heirs of God. An heir is one who has received an allotted possession by the right of sonship. When individuals are joint heirs of an estate, all share fully and equally in the entire estate. One, do, one doesn't own this part, another that part. Together, they own the whole thing. All those who are children of God together share the full inheritance. 